Good morning, everyone. It's incredible to think back and realize we've been facing this pandemic for about six months. In some respects, it feels like it was just yesterday. And in others, with all that's happened and all that's changed, it feels like it's been years. It's true that in Vermont, as compared to other states, we've been spared some of the worst of the devastation seen in this crisis, like the tragic loss of life. 185,000 in the U.S. and 33,000 in New York alone. And the surge on beds that overwhelmed hospitals in many states. And there's no denying that our success is the result of Vermonters' dedication, perseverance, and commitment to one another. If you've followed the health department's guidance since the very beginning, whether it's wearing a mask, staying home when sick, limiting your travel, or changing the way you do business to help your workers who can work remotely to do so. You've done all this in order to keep each other healthy. This hard work has kept your family, friends, and neighbors safe, helped us reopen most sectors of the economy to some extent, and more importantly, kept them open, unlike other states who opened too quickly and had to backtrack. It's also kept virus levels low, low enough that public health experts continue to tell us we can open schools for in-person instruction. I also thought it was fitting to recognize Vermont's strength and commitment to each other today, August 28th, as we mark the ninth anniversary of Tropical Storm Irene, which brought out the best of Vermont, even as we face incredible adversity. Like Irene, this pandemic and what we had to address um, as a result has come at a cost. There's still tens of thousands of Vermonters on unemployment. Families are struggling to pay their rent and put food on the table. There are thousands of small businesses who can't make ends meet because of capacity limits. And many of our critical institutions, like hospitals and colleges, face steep, unsustainable fiscal challenges. Working with the legislature, we've been able to take advantage of federal funds by injecting those dollars into the economy and put policies in place like foreclosure moratoriums, expanded UI eligibility, and uh, increased human service benefits to support working families. But I know it's not enough. And our work to restore the fiscal foundation of our state and for the families who count on us and who we need must and will continue. One area we focus on is the healthcare sector, working to stabilize our hospitals and smaller practices and support those frontline workers who put their safety on the line to protect their neighbors during a once in a century pandemic. This included 275 million in healthcare grants to help make sure the foundation of the healthcare system remained intact and $28 million in hazard pay for health care workers. I'll now ask Secretary Smith to update you on these grant programs, uh, as well as our ongoing commitment to providing additional benefits to address food insecurity. Secretary Smith. Thank you, Governor. Uh, today I would like to provide an update on two of the coronavirus relief fund grant programs being administered by the Agency of Human Services. It, they are the Frontline Employees Hazardous Pay Grant Program and the Healthcare Provider Stabilization Grant Program. These are two programs that were authorized by the legislature and signed into law by the governor on July 2nd. Let's start with the Frontline Employees Hazardous Grant Program. This is a program for certain public safety, uh, public health, pu health care and human services employees who, who the employers whose employees were engaged in activities substantially dedicated to mitigating or responding to COVID-19 uh, during the public health emergency uh, during the eligible time period of March 13th through May 15th. The online application portal for this program opened on August 4th. 
So far, we have received 460 applications. To date, 70 applicants have met our review criteria for completeness, accuracy, and appropriateness, and will be awarded a total of $10,397,000 uh, early next week. We expect to get those checks out early next week. The total appropriation for this program is $28 million. The grant review team still has many applications to review and is currently working daily on application approvals. There will be much more coming in the, the next several weeks. Applications are being reviewed in the order of the application submission. We expect to review all applications received in August by mid-September. Funding determination will be made for eligible applications on a first-come, first-served basis, subject to available funding. Applicants will be notified of approval in batches consistent with the order of applications submitted. The request for funding through this program has been significant. Once uh, enough applications are determined approved to receive a grant award and all available funding is allocated to eligible applicants, AHS will post an announcement on the Frontline Employees Hazardous Pay Grant Program website and not permit new applications through uh, the application portal. In addition to the hazardous pay grants, I want to give you an update on the Healthcare Stabilization Grant Program. We are currently readying the first round of payments to go out uh, under this program. Throughout the COVID-19 emergency, we are focused on the financial stability of the entire healthcare system, including providers of an array of social services. Uh, preserving access to essential services requires buffering the uh, providers from the financial instability of business disruptions and increased costs resulting from COVID-19. It has been and continues to be important to identify the providers who are experiencing financial distress and offer financial assistance for those organizations to prevent providers from being forced to close their business. During the immediate crisis, AHS was able to get dollars to those who needed it, but a broader program was necessary. I again want to thank both Governor Scott and the Vermont General Assembly for their support in establishing the $275 million health care provider stabilization program. But I also want to thank the team at AHS who has been diligently working on the implementation of these two programs. Their focus and hard work has been instrumental in ensuring these programs are successful. This program, the uh, health care stabilization program, this program was designed for health care and human services providers for both COVID-19 related lost revenue and COVID-19 uh, specific incurred expenses. Again, between March 1st and June 15th, the first cycle application opened on July 17th and closed on August 15th. During this period, AHS received 351 applications from eligible, eligible providers. Of the applicants, 78% were new to seeking COVID-19 related financial relief from AHS. 22% had received some form of COVID-19 relief from AHS previously that could include uh, the initial April retainer payments, sustained monthly retainer payments, direct payments to hospitals or financial assistance to uh, uh, specialized service agencies or designated agencies. The total applications received to date, a total request of, a, of over $116 million. It is important to note that the number may go up or down as the review process continues with the agency. We anticipate having a better picture within the next two weeks. The applications covered a broad array of provider types, including dental practices, chiropractors, nursing home, physical therapists, assisted living and long-term care facilities, acupuncturists, uh, neuropath physicians, DAs, SSAs, like I said, designated agencies, hospitals, ambulance providers, 
just uh, the AHS will be issuing the first award notifications to 93 early next week, 93 providers early next week. The total of this first batch of distributions is $4,459,000. These are mostly smaller entities who were severely impacted because of COVID-19. And, and we are trying to get out those as quick as possible. Uh, substantial amounts will be going out over the next few weeks to other entities, usually larger entities, that more information has to be sort of reviewed before we get the, uh, the money out the door for them, but those will be going out in the next few weeks. To the extent these are funds remaining after the grant awards are issued for the first cycle, AHS plans to administer a second application cycle in the coming months. This next round will cover additional COVID-19 expenses or lost revenue for the period from June 16th to September 30th. And we expect to have a robust application period during that time. Why I'm up here, I just also want to mention uh, another thing. Um, Vermont has applied for and received an allotment of increased benefits for those families receiving three squares benefits to be paid out in the month of September. Vermont has provided these supplemental benefits since March for a total of over $16 million extra paid out to Vermonters in supplemental benefits. This extra help is available to Vermont as part of the federal coronavirus relief bill it, it will not be a permanent change to households' monthly benefits, but it is critical to provide eligible Vermont families with additional resources during this time of uncertainty so they can put food on their tables. Three square Vermont households will see an increase to their maximum benefit based upon their household size. And three square Vermont households do not need to do anything uh, to get the increased benefit. If eligible, you will see it in the same way you get your benefits now, on an EBT card, through direct deposit, or by check. If you or your family are struggling to provide food to your family and are unsure if you are eligible for benefits, we would encourage folks to visit dcf.vermont.gov to learn more. I'd like now to turn over the presentation to Commissioner Pichek for the update, the weekly update. Uh, thank you, Secretary Smith, and good morning, everyone. Um, this week, we will start with an overview of our data here in Vermont, and then transition to some data about higher education and the reopening uh, that is currently underway as well as um, some data on K through 12 reopening uh, before turning to our regional data, and then finally uh, an update about our travel map. Uh, so to begin with, I wanna remind everyone that you can find this presentation for those watching at home on our website, uh, dfr.vermont.gov, has all of our previous presentations and modeling partners uh, as well. So as we said, um, starting with Vermont's data this week, our numbers uh, we're quite steady. We reported 50 new cases since we last met. Uh, that's down from 60 from the previous week. We continue to maintain the lowest uh, per capita infection rate in the country since the start of the pandemic. Also maintaining the lowest um, infection rate uh, for the last seven days across the country as well. And also the lowest positivity rate in the country. So really, against almost any metric that you can measure Vermont by, whether throughout the entire pandemic or more recently, uh, Vermont continues to be uh, the best in the nation. When we look at where these uh, 60 or 50 cases were across the state, uh, we do see on a per capita basis that they were rather evenly split. Compared from last week to this week, we do see more cases in the southern part of the state, particularly in Wyndham County and in Bennington. So something for us certainly to keep an eye on, but as we said, cases are pretty low across the state and on a per capita basis, uh, pretty low in each one of our counties. We also saw this uh, reduction um, in cases from last week while we were still ramping up the amount of tests that we did this week. We conducted over 16,000 tests. I think I mentioned last week that we had conducted over 
15,000 tests, and that was the highest amount of tests in a, in a single week uh, since the start of the pandemic. We've now uh, gone beyond that, done 16,000 tests, many of that tied back to higher ed, but that in part um, attributes to our low positivity rate. But as we'll get into here in a minute, um, it also signals a successful restart to higher ed as well, because we're not seeing early on here, but we're not seeing the kind of uh, spikes that we were worried about, uh, and uh, we're seeing really steady uh, numbers and openings from, K, from uh, higher ed. So going uh, to the uh, restart metrics first for Vermont, uh, these are the broad-based metrics that we measure every week. Uh, they are very stable, as we said, syndromic surveillance continues to be low. The viral growth rate obviously continues to be low as well. Positivity, number one in the country. Uh, and then in terms of hospital capacity, we still have a pretty strong hospital capacity uh, if any of those other trends uh, ended, ended up turning uh, less favorable on us. So from, those, uh, from that standpoint, very favorable as well. Looking now at our forecast for the next uh, number of weeks, we had reported, I think, in the last previous two updates that uh, we are anticipating a, a slight increase in cases. Uh, this week is the first time uh, in the last couple of weeks I can say that the projections are indicating a steady um, flattening of our numbers over the next few weeks. Uh, you can see that we've tracked pretty close to our forecast uh, over the last six weeks or so, um, and we anticipate really low-level growth uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, not factored into this, although separately, uh, separately discussed, will be the higher ed reopening and K-12 through reopening as well. But K-12 through uh, and higher ed have much more likelihood of success as our broad-based numbers remain low, which is, which is certainly great to see. Turning now to the uh, higher education and K-12 through data, uh, we really thought it would be uh, important to maybe to talk a little bit about the higher ed uh, situation and provide a specific example since there has been so much discussion in the national media about college, college campuses and universities that are struggling uh, during their reopening plans. Uh, particularly uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill has been mentioned a great deal uh, in the media. Um, and since we have a few schools here in Vermont that have already brought all of their students back to campus and have at least tested everyone once, we thought it'd be valuable to give a, a direct comparison uh, between a Vermont University uh, and uh, UNC. But before we do that, I just want to mention some of the items that we're seeing uh, that certainly uh, will impact uh, whether or not uh, you have the likelihood of a successful uh, reopening on campus. Uh, so certainly uh, when we look at places across the country that are struggling um, and we look at places that are reopening successfully, it seems like just the sheer size of the student body certainly plays a role. The larger the institution, the more difficult it is uh, to keep track on all the students, the more difficult it is to operationalize whatever public health <clears throat> guidance that you've uh, instituted. So that's certainly a key factor and something that plays uh, into Vermont's benefit. Looking at the prevalence of where the students are coming from, whether that's where the campus is located uh, or the prevalence of the virus from where the students are coming into the state from is critically important as well. And again, we'll see that that's benefiting uh, Vermont to a great degree. And then also the testing policy and program that's in place. And again, we'll, we'll draw some direct comparisons here, but you see that that uh, certainly, again, is greatly in Vermont's favor. So as we mentioned, we wanted to make this direct comparison with Northern Vermont University, which has now brought all of its students back uh, to its two campuses at Lyndon and Johnson, uh, and uh, UNC, which uh, attempted to do the same, but really had to put the brakes on and move to remote learning. So you'll see just in terms of the sheer size of the student body, uh, Northern Vermont has about 1,500 students, uh, while UNC has 30,000 students. So a much bigger challenge for them when they're trying to successfully reopen their campus for on-person or on-campus in-person uh, instruction. But when we look to the prevalence, I think that's the thing that is probably key here. When you look at Northern Vermont University with about 60% of its students coming from Vermont and the remaining 30% coming largely from the Northeast, uh, you see that the weighted average of that prevalence of where students are coming from uh, for NVU was 17 uh, out of 100,000, so 17 cases out of 100,000 people uh, for that 14 days before they started uh, coming back to campus. So that's a weighted average. We've determined you know, what percentage of the population is coming from what state and what that state's infection rate was during those two weeks. And you can see here that Northern Vermont University, 17 out of 100,000. Comparing that to UNC, that had 205 infections per 100,000, uh, basically 12 times more virus prevalence 
uh, for the states where students are returning to UNC from than compared to Northern Vermont University. So Dr. Levine has made this point um, in previous press conferences, but thought it would be helpful to put some numbers to that and show that specific example. And then lastly, we talked about testing. You can see that the testing policies were very different for both institutions. Uh, Northern Vermont University followed Vermont's reopening guidelines and then some by testing all of their students on day zero, testing them again on day seven, and then even testing uh, faculty and staff as well, uh, where, U where UNC was really uh, under a testing regime of people that are symptomatic or people that are exposed to COVID-19. So they did not have a universal testing policy. And again, you can see how that played out. Uh, Northern Vermont University has conducted about 1.3 tests per student, uh, where UNC is just a fraction of that, a point. 1.6 tests per student. And then you can see the final results. Northern Vermont University has had zero uh, positive tests, while uh, UNC is really leading the country, unfortunately, in terms of the number of tests that they've had on campus with 945, with 500 of those coming uh, in their most recent week. So again, I think that's illustrative of the example, but it's also, um, it's illustrative of what broadly is happening in higher ed restart uh, here in Vermont. Uh, the next slide shows how many students are going to be on campus this fall, whether that is living on campus or taking classes on campus. It's just over 21,000 students across all of our colleges and universities. About 15,000 of those uh, individuals will be coming from out of state, with the remainder from Vermont. And then you can see that just over 9,000 have already returned to Vermont. So if you think of uh, those students from Vermont as having the same type of risk that we all have, and you think of those coming from out of state as maybe having a higher degree of risk, uh, we're already more than halfway through all of those out of state students coming back to Vermont. So uh, certainly a good sign by this time next week, uh, likely we'll be close to 100% of all students transitioning back uh, into Vermont. And then when you look at the results, you look at the tests and you look at the, the numbers, they have been really um, positive early on, really um, favorable in terms of uh, what the trends are showing, uh, 86 100 tests, almost 8,700 tests have been conducted across all of the colleges uh, with only 19 positives reported so far or positivity rate of just 0.22%. So again, I mentioned how Vermont has the lowest positivity rate in the country uh, and our positivity rate was you know, something around 0.5%. So this is half of even what Vermont's positivity rate is. So I think this is indicative of students following the pre-arrival quarantine guidance. Uh, they're not coming with the virus as frequently as we thought they might. Uh, so again, all of this, at least for the transition back to Vermont, uh, is all a very good uh, story so far. I want to just touch a little briefly on K through 12 reopening. We have here a map that we've created. Uh, it's going to be an interactive map that we will make public that shows um, what each of the school districts reopening plans are. It will have a link to their reopening plans. It'll talk about the reopening in terms of how many days are they planning to be remote. So is it fully remote or is it five days uh, in person? And I think that will be helpful for people to see the differences across the state. Um, and then it also allows us to put together uh, some information and some data uh, that we can monitor throughout the school year. So this is a map that we plan to publish next week uh, and keep it updated uh, as school districts change and as things develop uh, throughout the school year. But we can see early on, at least as things stand now, uh, that about 65% uh, of all students in Vermont are going to be remote at least three days a week, uh, so three, four, or the full remote throughout the week. So um, that is something that is interesting, I think, for us to look at and will help us uh, model out uh, the likelihood of uh, a successful uh, K through 12 reopening as well. So lastly, I just want to touch on the regional data. Things uh, across the country are relatively stable. Uh, the only place where cases are increasing is in the Midwest. There are a few states where uh, people have some concern, but largely cases have uh, continued to slowly inch down. When we look closer to home, uh, we do see that our cases did increase this week in the region, up about 7.5%. Um, that, that's breaking a four-week trend of decreasing cases, but when you look at the individual states, there's nothing particularly uh, concerning uh, across our region, uh, just a, an uptick this week. And then when we look to how that uh, translates into the travel map, um, because some uh, counties of similar population size went to green and others went back to yellow or red, we actually stayed flat this week in terms of the number of individuals eligible to come to Vermont uh, at 6.6 .6 million uh, individuals eligible to come to Vermont without a quarantine. 
Um, you can see when you look around our travel region, Essex County, New York is still red, largely from the outbreak that occurred last week. Uh, you also see that Cheshire County uh, in New Hampshire, where Keene State is located, has turned to uh, yellow for the first time since we started uh, showing this map. Uh, you also see some issues in Maine as well. We mentioned the wedding last week that occurred in Maine, but um, that the, those cases have spread to other parts of the state, including York County, where now you see that moving from green to yellow. Uh, so a few things to keep an eye on across our region, but uh, pretty stable overall. And you can see that stability when you look at the county by county comparison map, some areas of improvement, some areas where there's worsening, but nothing that stands out uh, particularly strongly. And then lastly, we just wanted to show a, a slide now that we're getting toward the end of summer that shows the out-of-state uh, mobility of visitors coming into Vermont uh, throughout the summer. You see that we were down from uh, our baseline of about 60% from the start of the summer. Uh, we got back up to about 40% below our baseline. So there's been improvement throughout the summer, more visitors coming into Vermont, um, but obviously still significantly down from a normal summer. Uh, so certainly more help uh, is on the way or needs to be on the way for the lodging uh, and tourism industry. But with that, I will now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. I'll be talking this morning about a few items regarding the CDC, uh, a little more data on colleges, and finishing off with uh, some comments on flu vaccination. Don't have much to add in terms of outbreaks or concerning events we're monitoring. Um, there's always a scattering of these throughout the state. Fortunately, the numbers are always very small. I remind you that sometimes it only takes two cases to qualify to be an outbreak. Um, and almost everything we're following is below the number six, putting it into an area where we don't really um, divulge much information about it because they're very self-limited and contained and never evolve, fortunately, in our recent experience. Talking about the CDC, I think everyone, especially those in the media, uh, are aware of uh, some new guidance the CDC has come out with that has been uh, labeled as somewhat controversial. So on Monday, uh, testing guidance was uh, changed by the CDC to say that people who are asymptomatic may not need to be tested, even if they have been in close contact, meaning within six feet, of a person with COVID-19 infection for at least 15 minutes. This change did raise some eyebrows among state public health officials and the medical community. As I've said throughout the pandemic, our recommendations will evolve and change as we learn more about the virus and the science and new information will inform our decisions. But after a, more than a half a year, and millions of cases worldwide, our experience is that people who may have been in close contact with someone with the virus may be at risk of having contracted it and they can themselves shed virus before they show symptoms, the so-called pre-symptomatic state that I've talked about previously. We noted at that time that Vermont's recommendations for who should get tested are not changing at this time. People who have COVID-19 symptoms should absolutely be tested. If their provider recommends they be tested, they should be tested. And for those who have had close contact within six feet for about 15 minutes or more with someone who tested positive for COVID, they can certainly be tested. In addition, for these people, if they're part of or interact with a vulnerable population, we might even more strongly encourage testing. Keep in mind that by definition, individuals like, like those I've just described might be identified in a contact tracing enterprise and during the contact tracing, they would be advised to quarantine. The goal of that, of course, is to make sure that even if they are asymptomatic, but capable of transmitting virus, they will have been isolated from the general population and not be at risk of spreading that virus further and creating an outbreak. 
The whole strategy of containment, testing, isolating, contact tracing, and quarantine has been fundamental to our success in Vermont and needs to continue. And underpinning its success is testing. It's important to accurately know the percent positivity in our state as we talk about every week and you just saw here. And you can only do that if you have a sufficient number of people in the state tested who have no symptoms. If you're only testing people who are highly likely to already have the virus because of their symptoms, you will come out with a very high percent positivity rate that won't necessarily reflect the level of viral infection in the population at large in the state. So to be clear, our guidance in Vermont has not changed. Yesterday, in listening to the CDC director, it appeared that he was walking back his comments a little, though not the change per se. I'm not here to discuss what motivated the federal decisions, but I and many members of my own staff at the health department have close working relationships with people at the CDC. And I know that despite what may be questionable policy choices at the top, the science and evidence-based commitment by the organization at large is strong enough that sound public health practices will drive the work of keeping people safe and healthy. And it certainly does here in Vermont. The second um, newsworthy item from the CDC had to do with recommendations regarding travel and essentially uh, not um, mandating quarantine for those who have traveled either nationally or even internationally. This essentially leaves things up to the states themselves. As I mentioned, it doesn't necessarily have a national policy of quarantine. I regard that as a bit short-sighted, and I think that risks replicating the mistakes of the past, specifically how our country got into the pandemic in the first place. But again, we in Vermont have the same policy, the same map you just saw, the same zones of incident cases, and the need for quarantine if one is in a yellow or red zone. This has served us well and will keep us in good stead. In terms of colleges and universities, uh, and as they ramp up this year, I just want people to know that in public health, we continue to work very closely with their administrations and their student health teams to keep students, staff, faculty, and importantly, the communities healthy. Every school continues to do its baseline day zero testing and then day seven testing when students are arriving from out of state. And they are acting uniformly, quickly and appropriately when there are any positive test results. You've already heard about some of those positive test results from Commissioner Pichak and Several of these schools now do have students in isolation and, and or their contacts in quarantine. Keep in mind that the schools, in addition to a testing on day zero policy, also have a campus or dorm quarantine policy that is enacted when the students arrive as well. Some new cases also have been identified in asymptomatic Vermont students who are actually seeking tests here in Vermont prior to the departure for college and other states. And as I've said before, the occurrence of new cases from students arriving from out of state is expected, which is why we've had these months of preparation for this. And along with being in regular communication with schools statewide, our epidemiology team continues to attend weekly meetings between the City of Burlington, University of Vermont, and Champlain College on student return with a focus on prevention and mitigation of transmission. Finally, um, talking about flu vaccine. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be discussing our recommendations for flu vaccination, but making it as easy and efficient for everyone to get the vaccine will be a primary part of the strategy. We are also focused on the usual seasonal transitions. We're beginning to notice the early achievers of those leaves that are starting to bear their fall colors, a signal that summer's wrapping up and that our planning for cold and flu season is kicking into high gear. 
We're going to be discussing over the next few weeks the great importance of keeping the rate of flu in Vermont as low as possible to ensure that we don't face a so-called twindemic of both flu and COVID cases concurrently this fall and winter. Our primary focus will be to increase the rate of vaccination, especially among children and teens. To give you some data, last year, only 42.6% of our 5 to 12 year olds and 35.5% of our 13 to 17 year olds received the flu vaccine. We can and must do better. But I want to make one point clear. There has been no decision made to require universal flu vaccine for all K through 12 students. In fact, across the country, only one state, Massachusetts, has moved to require flu vaccination for students. A policy decision of whether to do so is still under consideration, driven as always by the data and science. As a physician and a public health chief, I would be shirking my responsibility to protect the health of Vermonters if we did not at least explore the merits as well as the weaknesses of every potential public health intervention. And that, of course, is especially true this year, as I mentioned, with the issue of convergence of flu and COVID at the same time. It's my priority to decrease the potential morbidity and mortality associated with both of these viral illnesses. And we certainly don't want to jeopardize the success of our return to school that might occur with an active flu season. And additionally, we must ensure that illness does not lead to the healthcare system becoming overwhelmed. So as I said, we will be discussing in the next several weeks our recommendations about how to make it more easy and efficient for everyone to get the vaccine, as that will be a primary part of our strategy. I'll turn things back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. And we'll now open it up to questions. We indeed were made aware of the situation in Rutland County, and per our usual protocols, we responded. Uh, we're investigating any potential outbreaks. The investigation is actually very early. We're uh, obviously interviewing possible cases, providing public health recommendations, conducting contact tracing, obviously recommending quarantine and symptom monitoring as needed. Currently, there are only a small number of cases. I'll remind everyone that small number means under six, um, and that precludes us from actually offering much more uh, descriptive information regarding uh, any of those. Do you know maybe sort of the origin of what's called a party, for instance, or like a gathering, or do we sort of have any sense of how this uh, uh, It was a gathering. Um, and we're actually trying to get more details on the exact nature of that um, and where the initial exposure might have actually occurred. And then shifting to the CDC guidance as well, um, I'm, you mentioned that Vermont were sticking with our own guidance, but I'm wondering if maybe this mixed messaging from the federal government and, and our own state government, maybe if this is confusing people or if that's a concern of yours that some people yeah, so I hope the mixed messaging is not confusing people. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time that we have come out pretty definitive about something in Vermont and said we are going by our data, our science, and sometimes our instincts uh, and our judgment. Um, so this has happened before. Uh, regarding the way the federal government sometimes messages about the pandemic versus uh, the way we message about it. But I'll just 
pick up on your point and make it quite clear um, that we still believe people who've been exposed to someone who is a COVID case um, should feel comfortable if they want to get tested uh, and that we are interested in them getting tested. Um, they will have inevitably been identified as a contact through contact tracing, so they will be quarantined, so they should be of no risk to anyone else, but at the same time, um, they uh, have the opportunity to be tested according to our current protocols. We're not worried about them exhausting our supplies of testing. Uh, we believe it's important to know if there are asymptomatic members of our population who could possibly transmit the virus, it's important to know that. And we want to know that in Vermont. Sure. And then I think just the last question for Secretary Smith, you mentioned that we've got money rolling out the door for healthcare providers uh, starting next week. Um, since this program was introduced originally a few weeks ago, uh, I'm wondering if you have a sense of maybe how many providers have, have gone under uh, it and yeah, Kelvin, I, I don't have that information of how many. I think I would have, if it was a, a, a pattern or a big number, I would have heard about it. But I would suspect it to, if there are any, it's a small number. Remember that we aren't the only ones that are helping in this regard. The federal government came in with some aid for hospitals and other providers. And secondly, just remember also um, we put out a lot of money during the height of the pandemic uh, just to keep institutions uh, afloat. We were very worried about the collapse of the healthcare system during the height of the pandemic. And as, as you know, through various programs, we did uh, dole out a lot of money uh, above the money that we're talking about here. So we were successful in sort of sustaining uh, and propping up the healthcare system during the times of most fiscal stress, this is helping to reimburse them uh, for the money that they spend or the lost revenue that they had during that time. Dr. Levine, on the college testing results so far, and that's a huge sample that you have in, more than half of the out-of-state kids who've now been tested at least once, are we, Obviously, it gives you comfort, but um, what is the risk going forward? Is that, that kids will leave the area and then return, or I mean, once they test negatively here once and then after seven days, what's the risk going forward? Yeah, one would assume uh, that the risk will be the risk any Vermonter living in any community has with our prevalence of virus across the state or within those communities. Uh, Another part of the guidance for the schools, and they're taking this very seriously, is on travel policies for their student body and their faculty for that matter. Um, and so they're being very restrictive about that because they recognize once these students are essentially Vermonters because they've tested negative coming in and now they're part of the, the environment here in Vermont, um, that we want to preserve that. And the only way to preserve that is to prohibit them from going back to the areas that might be higher prevalence on a back and forth basis. And many of them now have compressed their semester so that, of course, they're leaving right before Thanksgiving and not coming back. So uh, they're losing some vacation time between the start of school and Thanksgiving, and they're having a more compressed semester, uh, and then will come back sometime in the, in the winter or spring. Uh, so that's also going to help that effort. So I, I, I feel reassured, and I'd like to reassure others. We'll see how it all plays out. Um, with tourism down 40%, or visitor visitation down 40%, uh, do our super low numbers that have been so for a long time now, are they going to allow us to relax at all uh, with indoor activities, or are we just in our current the Jordan, the governor or myself? Well, it's, I guess it's up to him, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> when are you going to... Why don't I start, and uh, Dr. Levine can clean it up after. Um, you know, 
Our concern, obviously, uh, we have priorities. Uh, opening up uh, K-12 schools, uh, more in-person instruction would be my preference, but we have to prove ourselves and we have to get through this. Uh, opening up schools, the colleges as well, uh, bringing in a mass of people in one concentrated period is going to be challenging, uh, as we've said, and we're keeping track of that. So those are our priorities at this point in time. After we get through those situations, after we get over the hump, um, I would believe uh, that we will continue to do everything we can to open up the economy more. Uh, the more we're wearing our masks, the more we're keeping distance uh, from one another, the, the smaller gatherings we have are all beneficial, staying home when sick and so forth. So those are all beneficial uh, to our continuing uh, low positivity rate uh, in uh, low case count in Vermont. So if we can continue along this path, we can get through uh, those uh, the humps that I talked about in terms of opening up uh, the colleges and universities and the K through 12 in more in-person uh, education, uh, then we'll continue to expand. We'll continue to open up the economy, broaden that out more uh, as we see fit. But again, we're watching the numbers, watching the data, watching the science, and a quarter turn at a time of the spigot. This, this opening up of schools uh, and uh, is, is another qu a quarter turn of the spigot from my perspective. Anything to add? Secretary Smith answered the, the, most of the questions, but uh, again, from my perspective, I think we've seen a lot of interest uh, over the last, I think it was a week ago, uh, that we announced this program. Uh, so the uh, Department of Children and Families has worked very hard uh, and diligently to explore all kinds of opportunities, and we've seen a lot of interest. Um, we're going to continue to be challenged to put this into place uh, by September 8th, uh, but, uh, but again, I think uh, the progress we've made is, uh, is pretty substantial. And uh, I'm encouraged. And, and in terms of the teachers, uh, they uh, obviously will be uh, welcome into the system as well. We want them, uh, it's important for them to be uh, in person and in, in, uh, having in person instruction uh, for our kids. Uh, so we want to make sure their kids are taken care of as well. Secretary Smith. Thank you. Um, thank you, Aaron, for the opportunity to talk about this because there has been a lot of work in this area. Vermont After School, um, our prime, uh, the person that we've partnered with, Vermont After School has received over 150 uh, submissions from entities interested in participating in the school age child care hub project. Uh, in order to be eligible for these funds, the proposed child care uh, uh, must operate on remote learning days and great care right now by DCF is being taken to ensure that the potential hub sites can set up in locations appropriate for the care of children. I, I just want to give you some sense because there has been um, eight potential hub sites have been identified as of uh, Thursday uh, that yesterday uh, combined these uh, when you combine these hub sites, they could uh, provide approximately 1,800 child uh, care uh, slots. And, and these inquiries are came, came in from communities across the state and include a wide range of organizations, including which um, we're very happy to see, private business owners, licensed uh, child care centers, after school programs, town recreation and park programs, art uh, organizations, community centers, medical centers, and more. 
we're very encouraged of what we're seeing. And I just want to get back to talk about the eight potential hub sites that we have identified uh, so far. Um, they are, um, the project manager is reaching out to those potential sites to finalize the operational details and ensure that uh, these, these sites will succeed. Um, there are more sites close to competing, uh, completing the initial uh, vetting process and with Vermont After School and additional sites can uh, be anticipated to be announced uh, early next week, probably at the next pro press conference on Tuesday. Um, this is continuing. Areas we need, would like to highlight include um, where we would like to see some more um, uh, activity would be Brattleboro, Bellis Falls, Springfield, Bennington, and St. Johnsbury. Eight sites in six counties have been identified in Addison, Chittenden, Washington, Franklin, and Wyndham and Windsor uh, counties. As soon as final approval and agreements are in place, we'll be, we'll be able to offer more details in that. You talked about staffing, and, and I've heard this a couple of times, and I want to make sure that people understand what we're talking about with staffing. Um, you talked about some of the um, uh, existing daycare, uh, uh, excuse me, child care centers being, um, it's a challenge for staffing. Uh, staffing, staffing is definitely one of the challenges of this initiative, uh, but along with our community partners, we're looking to how to effectively staff these sites without draining the current system of care. We want to be extremely careful here not to destabilize what we've already uh, done in the system, and we've done a lot in the system, you know, a, a, above and beyond the uh, 16 million uh, that we're talking about here. Um, one of the things I, I want to make sure uh, that we, we understand, we've spent over $35 million in extra money to make sure that we stabilize our system during the height of the pandemic, that we had child care slots, and, and this, um, this additional money that we're spending right now. So we want to be extremely careful not to destabilize the system that we've worked so hard to make sure is in place and, and thriving. It's also report, report, uh, important to remember that this, this should be temporary. Um, to address a surge um, because of uh, the different uh, responses to COVID-19 that we're having. So with regard to the current identified systems, Vermont After School will be looking um, at staffing ever efforts for the hubs next week with the realization that we can't poach off of the existing system. And we'll probably do that through the grant programs to make sure that we don't poach off the system. And frankly, if you're an employee of the existing system and you're looking at these new hubs, these new hubs, again, are temporary. I, 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 they're, they're two different sets of uh, considerations you, you've, got to, you've got to look at, whether you keep with a permanent job or where you go with a temporary job. Uh, these are the sort of things that people, so I don't think we're going to see the uh, the staffing challenges of taking one, uh, stealing from one system to to uh, uh, to staff another system as we move forward. Hope I, I answered all your questions. I certainly took enough time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, all set, Aaron. Greg, the county. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Greg, the county courier. Uh, hi, Governor. Good morning. Um, I wanted to first ask if you had an update available about the DMV testing numbers that you guys were able to find out uh, if there was a, a drastic difference between the pass fail rate since you guys have been doing tests online versus what was going on in 2020. Yeah, unfortunately, um, the DMV, we did to explore that. Uh, the DMV only keeps track of the number of, uh, of pass um, permits, uh, not the failure rate. Uh, so they haven't been doing that. So we have no way of comparing. Um, so all we have is the, uh, the the pass rates. And to be honest with you, I didn't check to see if uh, the pass rates were up or down from previous years. But 
but that's will probably be uh, probably be a good question. Uh, the, the DMV collects a fee every time it's uh, every time there's a test yeah. taken, whether it's passed or failed. Right. So would I'm, there at least be a financial? I'm not. I'm not of, yeah, I'm not saying. Failures? I'm not saying that we couldn't get it, but it's not readily available. It's just not something we keep track of. So um, we could dive into it if it's really that important. Uh, but uh, but from our standpoint, we aren't seeing uh, a great difference. Um, so <clears throat> unless. Uh, unless again, it's of utmost importance uh, and we could dedicate some DMV people to going back in and, and doing it manually. I guess that's possible, but, um, but I'm not sure that there's a, a big need for it at this point in time. Okay. Um, well, moving on, I know that there's a time crunch here. So a uh, little bit of a drawn out question here, but bear with me. Uh, last night I attended, I attended a meeting uh, in the town of Richford about some serious decreases in peacefulness within the community, mainly driven by crime. Um, during the meeting, it was publicly stated that, uh, that the state of Vermont had relocated possibly more than two dozen families uh, to the community, to the hotels and hotels, as part of the response for COVID. With these families being homeless, you know, comes a lot of other issues, and, and that's not to blame families, it's just what happens to come with it. Um, but uh, a state police representative did mention that Richford has become the highest call volume community, not by population, just overall, uh, for the St. Albans Barracks. Um, the community has contracted three days a week, three nights a week with the Sheriff's Department, but, but can't really afford to contract any, anything more than that. State police have, have said they've got four troopers to, uh, to patrol 16 communities. And being that Richford is in the far corner of their coverage area, they really can't spend much time there. Um, community members are, are you know, starting to see that you know, this is exasperated by the unemployment issues in Vermont. And the perception, at least, is that idle hands are, are creating this issue to be worse. Um, so there's a couple questions that people wanted to know. One was, when is the state going to begin requiring unemployed Vermonters to look for work again so that at least they're busy doing that? Um, and then uh, the second question, I guess, is why, uh, why does the state feel it's appropriate to move a large number of, of um, families like this into Richford, but not support them with uh, criminal justice, policing? Uh, you know, it seems like there's a connection that the, that the state has caused some of this, uh, some of these issues in Richford, but they're not there to help with the policing issues. Uh, Greg, first of all, uh, was there any mention of the number of families who have been moved into the community by any chance? Um, I, I, I don't know the exact number. Um, an official in Richford believes that there were more than two dozen, which for, for Richford is, is quite, a, quite a large influx. Uh, and when you have large families staying in uh, a motel room that has you know, a little kitchenette, a little bathroom, and one bed, uh, you know, there's no wonder there's going to be some quality of life issues coming up. Um, undoubtedly, these are challenging times. As I mentioned in my remarks, families are struggling. People are uh, out of work. Uh, they still have 40,000 people on the unemployment, uh, uh, in the unemployment system. Uh, and this, that the economy is not opening up as quickly as we want it to. Uh, frustrating. Um, but this is a pandemic, and uh, again, there's no playbook here. We're, uh, we're doing the best we can to open up the economy as quick as we can, uh, as well as recognizing the fact that people aren't exactly um, coming in swarms to Vermont either uh, because of their own and maybe um, challenges with, with traveling um, and uncertainty uh, about COVID uh, in their own world. So 
uh, it's a delicate balance. Uh, so we're doing the best we can. Um, I might ask uh, either Secretary Smith uh, first and then maybe uh, Commissioner Sherling to respond to the, uh, the state police comments. But uh, or Secretary Smith first uh, to talk about those uh, displaced families. Governor, real quick, while you're still there, um, are you expecting that in the near future you're going to ask to reinstate the work requirement or search of work yeah. requirement? I know I've, I've yeah. talked to employers that have said, I have jobs, people just don't want to take them. Well, we're not finding, uh, again, uh, we, we keep track of the number of jobs available. Um, and it doesn't come close uh, to the number of people who are unemployed at this point in time. I think the last I had heard as far as on uh, the, the labor report, there may be 5,000 jobs open at this point in time. We have 40,000 people who are unemployed. So it doesn't, I don't believe there's any um, close proximity uh, to the numbers. So when it gets closer, when we start seeing more jobs available uh, and the, the number of those unemployed comes down, then we'll uh, reinstate that uh, that uh, requirement to, to look for work. But at this point in time, it, seem, it, would, it would be frustrating for many uh, to have to do this when we know that there isn't jobs available in their, uh, in their fields. Secretary Smith. Thank you very much for the question. As you know, when the pandemic hit, um, most of the shelters in this state started closing down for obvious reasons. It's congregate living. It um, was not safe to have that many people within uh, the shelter system. As a consequence, we have as a state housed approximately 1,500 people in hotels. Now we're starting to unwind that in uh, maybe a month or two maybe it's even three months ago, we announced a program to start moving people to permanent housing. That's not gonna happen overnight, but at the same time, we're starting to lower our numbers into the hotel system uh, down to about a, roughly 1,000 um, people right at the moment from the height of, of 1,500. We will continue that trend uh, downward uh, obviously, the hotel motel program can't continue. It's not sustainable. Uh, we have to move people into permanent housing. That doesn't mean we're going to eliminate the motel hotel program, but it also means that we have to get down to sustainable levels, uh, not where we were now. Just remember, too, because this is quite remarkable, we had a very, very low case count COVID-19 case count within the homeless population. This is something for Vermont to be proud of uh, in terms of what we did, how we housed people in need, how we made uh, them safe in times of need. Now we have to make sure that we move that to permanent housing. And as you, as you remember, we put substantial amounts of money through the Coronavirus Relief Fund, both in terms of moving people out of the hotel motel program and through ACCD in terms of building and some other entities, state entities, into building permanent housing. And we're in the midst of doing that right now. I suspect that you will see the numbers start to uh, drop um, at the crossings in, in, Rich, in Richford um, as, we move, uh, at, as we start moving forward. And we'll continue to do this um, into the future. Commissioner Sherling, anything else to offer in terms of the uh, law enforcement, state police? Uh, thanks, Governor. Uh, nothing specific. I'm not familiar with any uh, indications of uh, increases in call volume and registry. Not to say there aren't any as uh, inquired. Um, as the Secretary indicated, you know, AHS has done uh, an enormous amount of work to keep at-risk Vermonters uh, safe during the pandemic, and part of that is uh, is relocating folks to to various places around the state, and sometimes that does come with collateral uh, impacts on services. Um, we'll, uh, we'll work through the, the state police and, and local officials to ensure we're doing everything possible to, uh, to minimize that impact. I got the impression, Governor, from a lot of community members, that they're not blaming this on the people that were put there. They're, they're really frustrated with the state for creating this issue 
and not providing law enforcement backup in order to uh, take care of public safety issues. But I, I believe there was an incident where they actually had to call the fire department to uh, the public who owned land because, you know, there were some incidents with fires. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's a serious public safety issue, and it, the perception, at least, is that the state has created this, but they're kind of serving their responsibility to protect everybody now that they've created this unintended consequence. Of course, we didn't create the pandemic, uh, you understand. Uh, that was started by somewhere else and brought to oh, us. Oh, sure, and, so. and I don't think anybody's saying you created a pandemic. I'm, right. I'm, from what I'm hearing from the community, they're, they're saying, look, you know, the state, the state put a large number of people here uh, and, and we're not equipped with law enforcement for that influx of, of that type of population asking for help and basically being told, Sorry, we, we don't have anybody to give you. Yeah, again, first I've heard of it, but uh, we'll, we'll look into it yeah. and see if there's anything we can do to assist. And Greg, we really okay, need to spend 10 minutes and then we have uh, yep, 30 I, left. I know it's a time crunch. Thank you. All right. uh, Wilson, AP, and just sorry everybody, um, but now we only have uh, about 35 minutes left for questions, so, uh, and still 14 in the queue. Wilson, the AP. Okay, I'll, I'll try and be quick with my questions. Uh, this is for Dr. Levine. This might be a variation on the question I asked you months ago about what keeps you awake at night. But thinking about the CDC's guidance that uh, while Vermont is gonna stick to its existing protocol, um, does that cause you any concern that perhaps other states that might not be as diligent as Vermont uh, could somehow cause more cases to find their way to Vermont? And then secondly, a quicker question. How good is this year's flu vaccine? Is there any estimate on that yet? Um, so those are my two questions. Yeah, Wilson, I'd like to start by answering part of the first one, and Dr. Levine can add to it. Okay. But, you know, as you recall, when, when we started, we had the restart uh, Vermont, and we, uh, we started opening up the economy, and it was soon after that the CDC and uh, the feds came in and had their own plan as to how to open up the economy. We decided that we, uh, what we were doing was working. Uh, we, we were apprehensive like everyone else, uh, but we thought we had a plan uh, that, uh, that would fit Vermont. So we stayed on that plan. We didn't go with the CDC uh, guidelines and, and the federal guidelines on that, and we've been successful. Uh, as I stated then, um, again, we were going to, as long as we're given the latitude, we're gonna do what we've been doing because it's working. Um, so I have uh, great faith in our our uh, experts, our healthcare ex experts, and others uh, about the path forward, and uh, and I think that it's uh, again, it's been the proof is that it's working. So we're going to continue along that path. I will say the CDC, when it came out with the, the travel the guidelines, in fairness to them, I believe they said uh, that the, you should adhere to the state guidelines, which that's what we're trying to to make sure that people are adhering to our modeling uh, coming from state counties and that we're, uh, we're verbalizing that. Dr. Levine. And I'll just add to that, uh, that I really do think public health officials across the country have reacted similar to the reaction I showed this morning. So I lose less sleep about the other states because I think they're gonna end up doing the right thing uh, unless they have some ideological reason not to do so. So I think they will adhere to that pretty well. With regard to the flu vaccine, usually we figure that out, the efficacy of the vaccine uh, as the season's evolving. Um, so it's a little premature to comment on it yet. Um, I do know that um, we do look at the Southern Hemisphere's experience and try to see uh, what the match is like, if you will, for what went into the vaccine and what they saw in the Southern Hemisphere. And I don't yet know uh, what that data looks like, but that would be an early sign, but uh, it'll take a lot longer to come up with the answer to your question uh, once the flu season gets rolling. Okay, great. I thank you both, as always. Peter, VPR. Uh, two quick questions for Secretary Smith. Um, Secretary Smith, you referenced earlier the 
the number of applicants for the hazard pay program, and I believe you said 70 uh, had qualified for $10.3 million. Um, just doing the math, it seems like a lot per applicant. Do, do each of those applications represent multiple individual employees? Um, do you have a, a total number of employees who are be getting that money? If you're correct, it's multiple employees because it's employer that submits um, ah. for the um, uh, for for the program. Um, I don't have the number of employees, but let me see if I can get that to you. Uh, so you don't have the average amount going to each individual employee either. Right well, there's two there's two um, buckets that will go. You either get twelve hundred. Um, uh, or uh, I can't remember specifically. There's, it, it's by law, Pete, that you get um, a certain amount per employee based upon the number of hours that you work. Good enough. Um, some question for you. Now that we know uh, that uh, approximately two-thirds of Vermont students or two-thirds of Vermont school districts um, are going remote for more than half of the days of, this, of the week, um, how many child care slots is the state going to need in order to accommodate the demand that is going to accompany those remote learning plans? We're, we're anticipating about 10,000. Um, 3,000 through existing programs and 7,000 through the hub programs. We had a we had an early look into the sort of the remote um, activities that uh, were happening and, and took a guess. We think we're going to be pretty close into what the need. Just just so you know, that's almost doubling the existing system. I think we have about 12,000 slots right now, um, so we're almost uh, doubling the exist, existing system. And, and, and Pete, the, the the eligible employees receive net hazard pay that is uh, that is between twelve hundred or two thousand, depending on the hours that you work. Got it. And, and just to be clear, you said uh, you're going to need ten thousand slots to accommodate those students. Um, you said earlier on there are eight, you anticipate having uh, capacity for eighteen hundred, based on what what the response has been so far. So far, yes. And that doesn't, if, if, Peter, Peter, that does not include the expansion of the existing programs that we were talking about um, by law change or what the governor did the other day, which is uh, through executive order, allow these home-based um, uh, facilities to take, um, to take school-aged children during school school periods. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Courtney, uh, Local 22. <coughs> Secretary Spence about cases of reopening. I'm wondering, um, with all of the new safety regulations put in place for in-person instruction, was there a need at all for Vermont schools to take on or hire more support staff to accommodate those changes, what does that be like bus drivers, um, teacher aides, school nurses, or even like guidance counselors? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, I think there are uh, several districts I know of have uh, hired additional staff to implement guidance. Um, I think in some cases it's around implementing uh, the health check, the daily health check, for example. I know districts have hired um, bus monitors uh, to deal with that and also additional nursing staff and so forth. So I think there are um, cost implications for implementing the guidance and uh, I know also the districts um, are utilize, utilizing or plan to utilize their federal money either under the CRF or what we call the ESSER fund uh, to address those additional costs. Okay, and can you just touch on, I guess, there will be here a lot about um, teachers anxiety about getting back in the classroom. Um, can you talk about the role of support staff um, around kids being safe going back to school? Yeah, I think, you know, traditionally support staff uh, fulfill a variety of functions, particularly when we think of paraeducators um, typically implementing student individual student education programs. 
Um, I think, you know, there's a couple areas I think schools are uh, staffing up, if you will, and one is to, as you mentioned, to implement the, the logistical elements involved with the health guidance and so forth. I think the larger issue of student supports is still unknown. I think that we're, you know, district will be focused on reopening first uh, and then begin to uh, bring online their support systems for students and then start to articulate the staffing needs around that. So on the second question in terms of uh, additional supports for students, I think it's a little early. Um, but I think the first question, districts are ramping up staff to implement the health guidance. Okay, thank you. Eric, the time is <coughs> Yes, I believe this is for Secretary French is also impossibly Dr. Uh The state CDC guidelines for students and staff returning to school uh, requires that anyone who has a temperature over 100.4 degrees be sent home. And in the Barry Montpelier area, schools are considering excluding anybody who has a temperature over 100 degrees. So is there any concern that students who want and could get in-person uh, education under state guidelines could be excluded under more strict guidelines from individual schools? Uh, Secretary French, uh, the first I've heard of a district implementing a more stringent requirement. That's something we definitely would want to talk with the school district about. We are in the process of implementing uh, and offering a statewide uh, health check or health screening application for districts. And there's three elements to that. And one is uh, the first question is, have you had close association with someone with COVID-19? The second one is a series of symptoms. And then the third question is the temperature check of 100 degrees, 100.4 or greater. Uh, so I think the, the guidance is very clear on that. And I think we'll also be implementing an application that also brings some clarity to that. Um, but I'll definitely be interested in reaching out to the district to see uh, to what extent uh, the rationale for implementing more stringent than what we're, we're proposing or requiring. So how much discretion do districts have in creating their own uh, health-related admission standards? Well, I think this is the first instance when I've heard of a district uh, implementing something more stringent than what we require. Uh, so it's, that's essentially news to, to me. Um, but they have no flexibility in terms of meeting the, the, the requirements that we're establishing under the guidance that has the force of regulation. The question I guess you're asking is can they go beyond that? Um, yeah, that's, that's an open question, but I want to understand the rationale for that. And to your question, I would be concerned about um, them not necessarily excluding students, particularly when we know the, the science sort of behind the system checking. It's a very useful uh, screener at a certain level, uh, but it's by no means definitive. Alpha, Eric? Eric, we'll try and find okay. out a little bit more about that and get some clarity. Before we answer anything further. Okay, thank you. Tim from Mont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, you had mentioned uh, a little earlier uh, in the week, I think it was, about putting, maybe last week, about putting more money into marketing to help the hospitality creator, not obviously. And a survey came out yesterday that Vermont was is the number one destination for people who are planning to travel this winter, this is not by per capita either, this is total. Uh, one of the, the, the issues was uh, people looking for low COVID states uh, to travel to, and obviously Vermont is also a vacation destination. And uh, it, it's sort of a double-edged sword there. You want the, the people to travel here, but you don't want the sick people to travel here. Is there, it has, have you thought more about, um, I know you're working on schools mostly now, but have you thought more about the marketing of all Vermont's winter uh, vacation time and whether you would maybe cut back on that in, in response to um, not wanting sick people to come. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, we want to make sure uh, that we continue to have the low case counts, uh, low positivity rates in the state, and we're trying to do it safely. The marketing uh, dollars were in um, maybe forecasting what was going to happen in the future. if. Uh, if again uh, a vaccine was produced, uh, we wanted to make sure that we are uh, ready uh, to accept more people into the state uh, because we know that businesses, uh, particularly in the lodging hospitality sector, are struggling in particular, probably struggling more than any other sector uh, of the economy. So we, this was more in uh, preparation uh, for, for recovery uh, and uh, making sure that we had those dollars in place 
uh, so that we can implement that. Obviously, we are, um, we're going to have these conversations with the legislature, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll work through that. And if, uh, if they don't think it's necessary, uh, we'll, we'll continue to negotiate with them uh, again to make sure. And, and, you know, a lot of it will depend on the flexibility issue. Um, and, and so we put that into place hoping uh, that we would get more flexibility and more of an extension of time beyond 1231 uh, where everything has to be spent or we have to return it. So uh, again, we would not want to, uh, to prematurely uh, market uh, the state uh, before we're ready. So uh, good point, but, uh, but again, it's all dependent on, on what Congress does as well. Hi, this question, yes, hi, sorry about that. Um, this question is for Michael Pichek. I was wondering, in the data where we're comparing NVU to UNC, why wouldn't we compare something like the University of Vermont, which might have a more similar, we'll call it a similar student body, where people would be coming from more varied areas than just the Northeast? Is it only because that UVM does not have all their students back on campus and gone through testing? or? Was yeah. there another way the state could compare these schools? Yeah, Kat, that's right. And basically we wanted to pick a school in Vermont that has completed at least the process of returning students to campus and NVU has done that. And um, they're even, I think, probably two weeks into having students on campus. So they've done their, their day one testing and, and also their day test seven testing for everyone. So that was really the reason for the comparison at this time. Certainly, I mean, when you look at UNC and you look at our entire state and the number of students coming back, we have 21,000 students that are going to be on campus. They were anticipating 30,000 just at that one school. So, you know, I think we compare favorably just as a state, but certainly if you wanted to pick a state that was simil more similar to, to, or sorry, a, a higher ed institution, more similar to um, UNC, it would be UVM. But we can make that um, comparison certainly when UVM is done with its reopening. Got it. In the interest of time, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Ian Wallace-Allen, VT Digger. Hi, um, this is a question for Secretary Smith. I'm wondering uh, about course of contracts with the state. I know that the contract expires in October, at least to house out-of-state prisoners in Mississippi. And I'm wondering if the state is looking to renew the contract, and if so, for how long? Um, I'll let Secretary Smith answer that, but I believe we're having internal conversations about that very fact. So, Secretary Smith. If we do an extension of the contract, and we are having internal discussions about that right now, um, it would only be for a year um, that we would have uh, those discussions. What we would do after or what we may do in between that time is something that we're looking at right now. But I, I'm not, I, I, you know, until we sort of have plans, I'm not going to be announcing anything here. But right now, if we extend it, it, it would be for a year. What, what kind of changes would you like to see made to the contract if you guys renew it? Well, obviously, we're doing a lot of stuff now. For example, we're, we've put the um, institution, the Vermont uh, inmates, on a rotating basis for testing. Uh, we'll do that with the inmates that are negative. Uh, we'll continue to do that like if they were in an institution here in Vermont. We'll start three months from now uh, doing everyone uh, because we want to make sure that we are uh, testing everyone, even those that have had uh, the coronavirus. Uh, most, matter of fact, a lot of the inmates have sort of been in the recovery unit. unit. There are three units down there. There are the, the, the positive unit, the non-positive unit, and the recovery unit. The recovery unit is ready to get people back to the general population. And so that is um, uh, the bulk of uh, Vermont prisoners are there. Um, so we'll be looking at uh, testing. Uh, we'll be looking at access 
As you know, we're putting in camera, we're having, getting access to cameras in that facility so we can have eyes on that facility 24 seven. We're sending people down to that facility next week. Uh, but it would be having a closer sort of tabs on that facility as, as we move forward that we would probably look at in terms of contract, also safety of uh, inmates if we're doing extension. Are there any other options other than renewing the force civic contract? We're looking at that now. Um, I just have one more question, and it's for Dr. Levine. Um, Dr. Levine, uh, lately it just seems to me as though um, Vermont is testing as college students so much more than other states are, and I, I just don't actually see a clear reason why that is. I'm, obviously, I see the health reasons for it, but I'm just wondering what Vermont, what gives Vermont that ability that the other states don't seem to have. When you use the word ability, you mean just uh, access to testing and... Uh, Not necessarily. Either access to testing or money to pay for it. I'm just, it's, it's sort of a, strike, a striking difference that's starting to emerge the more I learn about these other schools elsewhere. Yeah, okay. So, we'll start with the public health rationale, which is uh, very, very well okay. illustrated by Vermont versus North Carolina. Um, you know, let's let's put up our uh, percent positivity rate as 0.7 percent for sake of argument a nice in between number for where we've been lately that's an order of magnitude less than the seven percent that north carolina has um, so some would argue that uh, states that have you know greater than a five percent positivity don't have any business reopening their colleges uh, some would go higher than that to 10% or what have you, but certainly uh, when you're below 5%, uh, a state would be encouraged to uh, reopen colleges. Um, we, we feel as a state that seems to be so uh, popular among regional students uh, and, and students from even further than the region who come from higher positivity areas that um, this would have a significant public health benefit. We have um, ultimately put it on the schools to make sure that they adhere to the uh, guidance we provided with testing. And they've all independently negotiated contracts with uh, uh, predominantly one, but several uh, vendors, if you will, uh, for doing the testing and uh, can get significant discounts because of volumes that they have in terms of the numbers they're testing and the frequency with which they're repeating the testing. Uh, so it's become uh, somewhat economical, if you will, if I could use that term for them as well. Um, and so all of the colleges have good access to testing um, and opportunities to get good discounts on the rates that are charged for that testing um, for now and throughout the semester. Um, so, I mean, this doesn't come up with your colleagues in other states, just the fact that some, some schools are only testing people who are showing symptoms or... Have, uh, yeah, no, it, it, it does come up because um, <clears throat> there are a number of states that have um, much higher populations than Vermont and schools that are on the scale of UNC, as you've heard, uh, that actually are doing aggressive protocols. I don't know if they're doing it uniformly across their state, or just in certain universities that are part of the state system, but they are doing them. Um, and um, I've been written up a fair amount uh, in, in the news as well. Uh, but then there are many states, as you're alluding to, that really are doing a symptom-only testing strategy and assuming that um, students will come back and if they get sick, they will be tested. Um, we just don't adhere to that as a viable strategy uh, to, get, to keep Vermonters safe and to keep Vermont communities safe. And certainly we think it's uh, not a viable strategy in a state that has a high percent positivity rate. All right. Thank you so much. No, I, I'll just end by saying it's not like there's abundant federal guidance on that. Uh, CDC specifically does not mandate testing college students. 
So um, states that aren't doing it uh, aren't actually diverging from any set rule book. Uh, but as the governor has said, you know, in many ways we're creating the rule book for many things and we feel very strongly about this one. Do you think there should be some federal guidance on the, uh, on the college testing? Um, I'm going to answer for Dr. Levine. I, I believe that they should watch what we're doing in Vermont and uh, maybe some other states would want to follow suit. I, I think this is, you know, another case where Vermont has taken a different path. Um, and I give great credit to Rich Schneider, former president of Norwich University, who led a group of, uh, of restarting our college and universities. And we were adamant about making sure that we did this safely, uh, as you might have reported in the past, I don't know if you specifically, Ann, but certainly many in the media have, uh, have reported about the, the amount of resistance, the amount of apprehension in opening up our colleges and universities. Um, and so we wanted to make sure when they did that we could provide some faith and trust that we're doing it correctly and having this much. I didn't expect uh, to hear a question about why we were doing so much testing uh, in our colleges and universities today. Uh, but I'm, I welcome that uh, because it does give us an opportunity to highlight uh, how well we're doing. And if we continue down this path, we can open up our colleges and universities in a safe way and provide for the testing to show people that we're doing it in a safe manner. Uh, then again, it builds upon that trust to further open up the economy, to further open up in-person in instruction in our K through 12 schools and so forth. We have to build upon our success in order to get back to some sort of normalcy. So I think it's a good sign. Uh, and I give, again, a great amount of credit to uh, the group uh, that uh, put this into place, as well as uh, to Dr. Levine and his team at the health department for working together and trying to do this. I was not asking why we're testing so much at colleges. I totally understand the, the health issues. Oh, I thought that's what you said. Why are we testing so much in our colleges and universities? Why is it so different from other states? I was wondering oh, what Vermont oh, oh. has the, okay. in terms of capacity or money or something like that. Okay, I thought there was almost like a complaint about <laughs> testing so much, but glad to hear that's not the case. Certainly not. All right, uh, Robin, the Caledonia Record. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you very much. First time on. Uh, I have uh, a question about vaccine protocols for, for Vermont. Forgive me if uh, this has been a topic discussed before. As uh, you're looking at flu vaccine, most people immediately shift. Okay, how would that translate to how a COVID-19 vaccine would be rolled out in Vermont. I know the federal government's working on getting plans together. What's Vermont's role in that? And how will you be uh, reaching out to Vermonters about how it will happen here? Yeah, I know. Um, I'll let Dr. Levine answer this uh, as well, but uh, we have a specific team, uh, the vaccine team that's looking into this and contemplating how we're uh, going to roll this out if and when, uh, or let's say when uh, the vaccine is proven, gone through the trials and is proved safe, um, how we would roll this out in Vermont. And, and I know that they're working closely uh, with our federal partners uh, to determine how to do that. But uh, again, it's early. Uh, I don't expect we'll see a vaccine for until the, until the next year, uh, but we are on it and we're working on it. The health department and, uh, is uh, taking the lead on this and Dr. Levine can uh, give more details. <clears throat> because we're short on time, I won't provide a lot of details, though, because that's what this team is charged with doing and already working on. Because um, as the governor stated, much will be directed by the federal government in terms of distribution to states. And states will see varying amounts of vaccine entering their state over varying time intervals. There will most likely be a request that there be prioritization early on so that the higher priority groups such as healthcare workers who are face to face with the disease and those in vulnerable populations uh, who might benefit early from the vaccine 
get it first, but then there will be issues about how to distribute that equitably across the entire population. We as a state want to make sure we don't get burned like we did early on with PPE when there was little access to PPE around the country. So we want to make sure basic supplies, syringes, needles, things of that sort, uh, are already in supply in Vermont so that we don't run into a problem getting vaccine and not having a way to actually deliver it to the population. So stay tuned. We'll have a lot more to report because this uh, uh, vaccine team is meeting on a weekly basis several times a week and addressing just these issues. And uh, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, so uh, switch to another topic. I'll follow up with a question about the team members and so on with the Ethan. Um, uh, broadband continues to be one of the top issues for remote learning in the Northeast Kingdom, the rural part. Um, some, I've had some people say it in online forums that they can't even reach out, get a response from utilities to come and install uh, the broadband services using the $2,000 that they could access. Um, is the state doing more to help utilities meet these needs? Um, that's the first I've heard that there was a problem with the utilities coming to uh, attach with the grant program that we put into place, um, but it, we'll follow up with uh, Commissioner Tierney from uh, the Public Service uh, Department and uh, find out if there's an, an area where we can assist in another way or we can uh, spur these uh, these cases along because, um, because I think it is important for people to provide the limited no amount of money that we have that we put forward uh, to utilize it wisely. Uh, and I look forward to the the federal government, uh, the Congress, working on this issue uh, so that we can solve uh, more broadband expansion across rural uh, Vermont and across rural uh, United States as well, because this is a, a big need in, uh, in this state as well as uh, in other states across the nation. Thank you. All right, Kevin, seven days. Can you hear me okay? We can. Governor, I have a quick question for you and then a question, a question for Secretary Smith. Um, Governor, what levers are still available to you to pull uh, to increase the ability of the tourism industry and the hospitality industry this uh, fall foliage season? And which ones are you eyeing if things go well with the education uh, sector to, um, to release a little? Well, certainly in the uh, lodging industry, increase the capacity uh, as well as in uh, trying to solve uh, the problem with the with the uh, restaurants in terms of uh, capacities as well. How do we move from outside dining to inside inside dining, and how do we do that safely? Uh, if we can do all that uh, in terms of marketing, as we spoke before, doing it at the right time uh, when we see our rates are are leveled out, uh, and that we can do so safely, uh, trying to bring more people into the state. So, those uh, those three things. That's what I'm eyeing. Uh, just increase capacities and uh, in utilizing marketing money to attract more people. Would you think that the 400 cases per million is something that could be adjusted or is that being set for now? I think it's uh, set from my standpoint. I mean, I think most uh, Vermonters appreciate the fact that we have a high standard here. Uh, we're going to adhere to that. Uh, and uh, I think the modeling that we've done, Commissioner Pichek has worked on, uh, is, uh, is, is working and we don't want to change that formula. Uh, just to, to satisfy another need because, again, our, our hope is uh, that the entire Northeast and other states, at least as we've seen over the last week, uh, their case counts are starting to be reduced so that we can open up the travel area to more people coming into the state safely. Got it. Thanks. And the question for um, Secretary Smith is, how much remote learning can parents really expect that their kids are going to get uh, at? where there are no teachers and there are kids from a variety of different um, ages and classes and grades. Kevin, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer your question uh, sufficiently. I'm hoping uh, that, that, you know, the remote learning will go 
uh, as planned. Obviously, it's going to be a challenge uh, as we move forward. But at the same time, I mean, we have a dual purpose in sort of opening up these hubs. One is making sure that the parents can um, um, provide themselves with a living and make it to work. And second of all, to make sure we have an op opportunity here to uh, give the child a place to go where there is interaction, where there is some form of uh, opportunities uh, to learn. I, I think we're going to have to just wait and see. Um, is, this, is this better than being in the classroom? No. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we're just going to have to wait and see and see and make adjustments, by the way, Kevin, if we have to, uh, to, um, to further help the child that are in these, um, in these child care centers. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for tuning in, and again, we'll see you on Tuesday.